Hi, this is Philosophy 70 and our first segment on epistemology. So as we know, epistemology means the study of knowledge or the theory of knowledge and it's asking questions like what do I know? How do I know? Uh, are there limits to what I can know? And we have today Plato's account on answering those questions or attempting to answer those questions. Certainly he's not the first person to ask these questions. There were philosophers before him, but generally um, a, a wide held belief among philosophers w was that, look, you know, if I, if I stub my toe on this rock, I feel it. The rock must be there. It's, it's real. So I can be certain that the rock exists and is here. But Plato and a few others said that doesn't work because sometimes we might have a pain in our toe and it feels like we stubbed it, but we didn't really stub it. So how do we know that this rock is real or not? You can't base it on your sense experience. So Plato is what we would call, or, or what we do call, a rationalist. He says, knowledge that is not gained through experience, but through rationality, through reason, through the mind, is what counts. He is not the first to give us a rationalist account either. However, Plato is the first to give us a fully drawn out, fully explained, fleshed out version of uh, how we know what we know and how, what, what counts as certainty. Before we actually get into his theory, let's talk a little bit about Plato himself. So Plato was born in 428 BCE. He was 81 years old when he died, so he died in 347 BCE. He was a student of Socrates. Socrates was um, about 40 when Plato was born. So um, when they met and Plato was roughly 20, um, Socrates was around 60. And Socrates had a reputation of going around the city of Athens and challenging everyone about their beliefs and their activities and asking them what they were doing and why they were doing it and uh, whether the it was a good thing or not a good thing. And he had a group of young men um, who followed him around, basically. They were students, or he was their mentor, and they learned from him and continued with the discussions that Socrates got going. So Plato was one of those students, and essentially everything we know about Socrates comes from Plato. Everything Plato wrote was about Socrates. Socrates did not write down his ideas. He wanted to discuss them in person. Plato wrote them down in dialogue form that looks like he's just actually taking notes of the discussion between Socrates <clears throat> and whomever. However, um, we can all agree, or scholars all agree, that it's not necessarily that he took dict dictation. He was remembering it to the best of his ability. So everything Plato wrote was about Socrates. Everything we, almost everything we know about Socrates comes from Plato. When we're talking about Socrates and Plato, it's okay to use the, the term or the names interchangeably. Technically, you would say something like Socrates said such and such, and Plato wrote such and such. But it's okay to say Plato said such and such, or Socrates, well, you don't, wouldn't really say Socrates wrote, but you could interchange the names of the two people because um, they are intermeshed. It's almost impossible to separate them. Scholars agree that the early writings of Plato were probably Socrates' ideas. And the late writings of Plato were probably Plato's ideas. And the stuff in the middle was a, a mixture, kind of hard to tell. So your reading for today is from Plato's Republic. And this was written during Plato's middle period. And so some of the ideas that are in here are Socratic. For example, his politics that we will talk about later on in the course, that's probably a Socratic idea. Whereas the um, material in epistemology for today is probably platonic. So we have a, a mix of, of ideas. So <clears throat> Plato's epistemology. He says the things that we sense are, are, are real, 
but they're less real than the things that they represent. And these things that they represent, he calls the forms. The, uh, it's capital F, the forms. Um, so he says that there are these things out there that don't exist as physical things, but they have always existed and they will always exist. And they are the forms. They are the real thing. So in, in his attempt to try and explain this to us, he gives us the divided line. So there's a copy here of it in your textbook on page uh, 34. So we'll be going over that. He also gives us the allegory of the cave, and we'll be talking about that. Sorry about that. Okay, so he is trying to explain what is real, what is true, what is knowledge, versus what is opinion. Opinions don't count. Uh, opinions are just something that somebody might think. It's um, for the most part subjective. For example, some people might think red is a good, good color. Some people might think purple is a good color. And there's no true right or wrong there because those are subjective opinions. Plato wants us to understand and have knowledge. He is trying to um, explain to us how we can tell. So. Let's talk about the forms. The forms are these things, like I said, that don't exist as physical entities, but have always existed. They always will. And the forms are the real thing. Everything else is a stand-in for a form. Forms have always existed. They always will. They are perfect. They are non-changing. And they are general. They're not specific. So uh, they're general in the sense that there's the form of the book, right? And that would represent or be the, the thing behind all books, whereas this is a specific book. So it is a book because it has bookness. It partakes of the form of the book. And I know that sounds a little weird. But um, some of what Plato's saying here, here is a, a little weird. So things are what they are because of the form of what it is. There is a form for everything. Everything that has ever existed, everything that will ever exist. Long, I mean, long ago, Plato's time, there was a phone for or there was a form for the cell phone. We didn't have cell phones, but the form existed. We needed to remember things, and that would ultimately lead us to remembering the technology to develop things like, you know, phones in general and cell phones uh, in specific. So here's, here's something that he says that's interesting. Everything is just remembering. We don't actually learn. We don't discover really. We don't learn, we remember. All learning is remembering. See, things or knowledge of things comes from knowledge of the forms. We knew the forms before we were born, when we were just these, uh, you know, non-physical essences that were out somewhere in this netherless, netherland world we knew the forms, we understood the forms, and we were aware of all of the forms. And more importantly, we were, we were aware of the forms having uh, the, the reality that the forms were behind everything. Then what happens is we get born into a human physical body. And when we're born, we get so distracted by physical sensations, so distracted by all of the data coming in, you know, you're 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 an infant and you're discovering your hands, you know, and you're you these these are all things that you knew about when you were not in a body, but now that you're in a body, these are things that you have to remember, and so that process of remembering um, 
uh, you know, takes a, a lifetime, of course. But what happens is that when you're born, you get distracted by all of the physical sensations, and that causes you to forget the forms. You knew the forms before you were born. When you're born, you become distracted by the physical world, and you forget the forms. You spend the rest of your life trying to remember the forms. The goal is not necessarily remembering all of the forms because that's not um, a necessary thing. You know, it, it's not necessary to remember the form of the cell phone when you're Plato uh, 2,500 years ago, right? And it's like, oh, yeah. You know, and, and you can imagine that there were people thousands of years ago who who said, wouldn't it be great if we could talk to that guy over there on the hill and see what uh, he, he sees from his lookout post, you know? Too bad we don't have some sort of thing that we can, you know, hear and talk to. And they remembered, essentially, the, the, the form of the phone. It's just they didn't have the technology to develop it. What had to happen for technology to progress was for people to remember small bits of information and then other people would remember other bits, and then people would build on that. Memories would spur other memories, which would lead us to progress. So when I was a, a, a kid and I used to watch um, Star Trek, the original series, right, and I would see Lieutenant O'Hara with that you know, thing in her ear, and she would be talking to other ships and people on the ship and, and, and whatever, and uh, there were no wires. And I was I was watching that, and I'm going, well, that can't be, you know, there, there has to be wires. She can't just have this thing in her ear. And of course, now just about everybody in the world can do that uh, if you can, if you can afford a, a you know, phone and uh, Bluetooth. We are all walking around talking to people without any wires. How did that happen? Well, the creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry, remembered a form of wireless communication. Something else probably spurred that memory that he something that he'd heard about from someone else, but he may have just remembered it. And then he wrote a story that contained that bit of, of knowledge, right? And somebody else saw it and went, you know, like I went, oh, you can't do that. You have to have wires. Somebody else said, huh, what if we can do that? We already have radio. What if we try and do some of this? And those memories spurred other memories of the technology until we came up with a, a way to do that. There are things that we might think about now. Um, be like, wouldn't it be cool if we could do such and such? We're remembering the forms of those things. We're not coming up with new ideas. We're remembering the forms. Now, sometimes, of course, we remember things and, and the technology or the ability to make those things or, or proceed with those things is just not theirs. Like I said, you know, cave people who want to talk to somebody out over there. Right? But for the most part, all of our learning is remembering and we remember new things and that spurs us to remember things and then that spurs other people to remember things so you know people had to discover electricity before we could build a cell phone you know people had to talk about um you know vacuum tubes and then transistors and silicon chips and so on and so forth things had to develop and as we see now you know this the phones get smarter and smarter and smaller and if we want and all of that is because we're remembering what we call a new technology, but the form of that technology has always existed. Okay. That form has always existed. All forms have. Now, since they are general, not specific, okay, there wasn't a, a, a form for, you know, the uh, BlackBerry Key One, for example. There was a general form, or there is a general form, for the cell phone. We don't actually know, and, and Plato does not ex, uh, explain, how detailed the forms are. Since they're not specific, they are general, they might be very general. They might be very vague. So it might not be that there's a form of the cell phone. It might be that there is a form of 
communication device. And so uh, this is a type of communication device and um, it partakes of the form of communication device. This is a specific representation of that general category of things. And of course it might be uh, uh, broader than that, it might be more narrow. So there might be form of communication device, might be form of the phone, might be f a form of the cell phone. We don't know, he doesn't explain. In Plato's outline here of the forms, in his discussion of it, he leaves out a lot of material, or we think he leaves it out. His, his idea is, look, you either get it or you don't. And if you don't get it, no matter how much I explain, you won't get it. But at some point, you will get it. At some point, you will have some insights that lead to all the connections about the forms and you'll get it. So I don't need to give you details, he says, you know, you'll, you'll get there. So is there a form for a uh, you know, 1973 orange Toyota Corolla? Nope, that's too specific. There is a form for color. We know that, or we assume that. Um, there is probably a form for vehicle or transportation device. Um, we don't know how specific that gets. You know, is there a form for the car versus a form for the um, the ox cart or the a form for a sled? Or do all of those fall under a category of things that can move people and things around. We don't know. It really is not that critical to know how specific they get. The thing to remember is that they are general representations. So he uses the example tree. A tree is a tree because it partakes of the tree, the form of the tree. It has treeness. Now, we look at a tree and we can look at a palm tree and an oak tree and you know a pine tree or a Christmas tree or you know whatever kind of tree and once we've been introduced to the term tree right we learned that word no matter what language you learned it in we look around and we recognize these other things as tree that's a tree but that's a tree too, even though they're very different. A palm tree and, and an oak tree are very different looking. We, however, have remembered the form of tree, so we're able to look at um, the, the, the tree and recognize it as a, as a tree. We do this with all sorts of things. Essentially, we have categories that are fitting into the form. So the tree is a tree because it has treeness. An apple has appleness. It may not have appleness as much as it has fruitness, yeah, or perhaps even the category of foodness. Right? But we can look at these different things and know that they are um, what they are because the form is there behind it. So I'm sitting here at my desk in my office at school there is a desk, in the classroom there are desks, in the lecture halls there are desks, you have desks at home. We know that there are many many different types of desks, different shapes, different colors. Why do we know that they are desks? They have deskness. They partake of the form of the desk. So this makes sense in, in a lot of ways. I mean, um, if you were to not understand them as a, you know, a category of like the desk because of the form of the desk, right? You would, you know, you would walk into a classroom and go, what's that? And we'd say, oh, that's a desk. And we'd be like, mm-hmm. And then there's another desk right next to it. And you'd say, what's that? And we'd say, oh, that's a desk. Well, what's that other thing there? Well, that's a desk. And we would, we would, you know, want to name them. Well, this desk here is Bob and the next desk is Juliana. And, you know, the next desk is Amy, whatever it might be. We wouldn't have this generalized category of all of these are desks. And we're, we know that they're desks 
because they have deskness. That's how the forms work. Everything partakes of a particular form. So here are four characteristics of the forms that you need to know. The forms are perfect. They are unchanging. They are eternal. And they are general. So a perfect category of the tree the category is perfect, but no individual tree is perfect because the individual tree is a specific representation of this perfect form of the tree. You can, you can look at the, the, the tree here um, as a stand-in for the form of the tree. The form of the tree is the most real. It has the reality. The tree that we experience has less reality because it's imperfect and it's changing, right? Um, and it will decay and end. And then we have an even lower category, which would be the um, the the picture or the drawing of the tree. It's you know it's twice removed from the reality of the forms. So we need to understand that. And the reason that this is important to Plato and, and, and to others is that because they're not only forms for things, right, but there are forms for concepts, right? There are forms for um, uh, emotions even. So we have the form of love. We have the form of beauty. We see something and we know that it's beautiful because we have partake or it partakes of the form of beauty. But the most important thing is that Concepts like justice and honesty, there are forms of that as well. So something is true because it partakes of the form of honesty. The, the book, The Republic, really, is um, uh, written about Socrates' quest to understand what justice is. Well, justice he will discuss when we get to the politics section later on. But basically, Plato was telling us there is a form of justice. And we recognize justice because we have remembered that form of justice. And, um, and maybe the easiest way to explain that is that, you know, sometimes you hear about something or you see something and you think to yourself, that's just wrong, right? <laughs> And you, you can't put your finger on it exactly. You're like, but that's wrong. I know it when I see it. Why do you know it when you see it? Because you know the form of justice or truth. And so you're remembering the, the form and this thing that you're seeing happen, um, you know, or this injustice that you're seeing, um, it does not fit with that form, right? It's not part of that form and you recognize you know, it's not a, f a just thing. It probably, uh, uh, we assume that there is also a form of injustice. And you would say this thing over here partakes of the form of injustice. I can't really explain why it's unjust, but it partakes of the form. So <clears throat> hopefully then we, we get a grasp and understanding that, that knowledge is remembering those forms and understanding that they are uh, the, the reality. And we need to turn, turn ourselves, or this is what Plato wants, is for us to turn our souls away from this world of opinion because opinions change and opinions uh, vary from person to person. And to turn ourselves to knowledge, to truth. Now, to help us try and understand this, he gives us the divided line. And sometimes that is a, a little difficult to to follow. Let's see if that gets on camera here. Let's see. Oops. It's backwards here. Okay, we got it. So um, you can see at the top we have modes of thought and objects. The easiest way to understand that is modes of thought is um, what's going on with your mind, right? What are you doing? Are you thinking? Are you imagining? What's going on? What are you doing mentally? And then the objects has to do with what is your mind working on, right? 
if you're imagining about things, you're imagining about images. So um, that gives us our mode of thought and our, our object. Now he, div he divides it into uh, four different sections here, four different areas. So we have over here in terms of the um, uh, objects, we have the visible world and the, oops, this is so backwards for me, intelligible world, okay? The visible world would be things that we experience through our senses, not just things that we see, but anything that we, you know, would hear, taste, touch, you know, feel, um, our senses. The knowledgeable, oops, here we go, the knowledgeable world has to do, or um, pardon, pardon me, the intelligible world has to do with the things that we know through our mind, not through our senses. So there's a line here that divides right? The visible world from the intelligible world. And uh, we don't want to live in the visible world. We want to live in the intelligible world. On the other side, we have a split between the world of opinion, the world of opinion, and the world of knowledge. So if we put this together, we've got in the visible world, we are dealing with opinions. We don't have any knowledge. We're experiencing things in terms of our sensory perceptions, and we formed opinions about those things, but we don't have any knowledge. Once we cross the horizontal divided line, the thicker one, and we move into the intelligible world, we move into also the world of knowledge. We start to know things. We start to understand things. We're starting to grasp the uh, ideas of the forms. Now, as far as all of the small print, if you can see that on the inside, my camera's not really picking that up, but hopefully you've got your book already. At the bottom we have, you are imagining about images. Above that, you have formed beliefs and you're talking about or th uh, thinking about visible objects. Above the horizontal line, you are thinking and you are thinking about scientific objects. And then at the very top, you actually have intelligence because you are thinking about the forms. You understand the forms. You've grasped them as a rational thing rather than through experiences. So you have the chart in front of you. And let's go show through and, and, and see what we've got going in each of these little sections. The very lowest form of uh, knowledge, although he would say it's not knowledge, would be imagining about images. Okay. So what are images? Pictures, shadows, you know, drawings, those kind of things. We would now include things like video and um, you know, photographs, whatever what representations we are. At the various, a very lowest form of, of our thought process, our modes of thought, we are looking at those Im images and mistaking them for real. Okay. So we are imagining about images. He uses the word imagining here, and I don't think it's a good choice of words, because we understand the term imagining as being a creative process. We're imagining things. We're thinking things up. Um, what he means here is simply that we are thinking about images, and we are mistaking them for truth or for, for being the reality. So, you know, when you have your phone and um, you've got, so here on my phone is a, oops, uh, a, a picture of my dog, right? I know my dog is not in the phone, right? My dog is sleeping here on the floor. So, I don't know if you can really see it. No, not so much. But the idea here is that this is an image of my dog my dog is a visible object of my uh, my dog, a visible object. And there is a form of animal or dog or something. So you've got the three steps of reality. The picture of my dog is the least real, it's twice removed from reality. Okay? And when I mistake the picture of my dog, right, I am 
twice mistaken. I am very mistaken. I mean, when you're talking to your friend, you know, when we're Zooming, any of that kind of things, you know your friend is not inside your phone, right? Yeah, okay, so you know your friend is not inside the phone. You understand that as that is an image. So you're a step above that. However, babies and animals um, sometimes uh, uh, are at this stage. I have had um, cases where I've been working on my computer and I've had a picture, uh, a close-up of the face of my one of my cats. And um, uh, the very cat that it was a picture of hopped up on the, on the desk and saw this picture of uh, itself and, and fluffed out and, you know, <laughs> right, freaked out because it thought it was a big cat. It was thinking that that image was real. Same thing, you know, if you've ever seen a, a, a dog um, or a cat look in a mirror for the first time, you know, the dog sees itself in the mirror and starts barking at it because it thinks it's another dog. They are mistaking images for reality, but they are very wrong. And, and we occasionally do it at, as well. Um, you know, I have been... Um, watching TV, for example, and there was a doorbell in a particular commercial, and I didn't realize it, I mean, it sounded just like my doorbell, and so I got up and went to the door, and of course no one was there, and then I realized it was on TV, so I had mistaken that sound uh, of on TV, which was a recording of a doorbell, and I had mistaken it for uh, reality. Um, we're all adults at this point, or pretty close to it, and we are in college. So, for the most part, we have moved beyond images and imagined. We have crossed the line up into beliefs and visible objects. We're still in the world of opinion. We're still in the visible world, but we are a step better. We are looking at the visible world the visible objects. We are looking at things, whether it's the book or the dog or the phone, whatever it might be, and we form beliefs about it. And the main belief that we believe is that those things are real. They are the end all, you know. I'm thinking about a book, okay, I'm imagining a book, okay, but now I'm holding a book. I'm looking at this book. I can feel it. I can touch it, you know, all of those things. And I form a belief that this book is real. Now, Plato doesn't say that it's not real. He just says it's less real than the form of the book. Me knowing that this book is here as a physical experience, yeah, that's just a belief. I could be mistaken. You know, um, sometimes I feel, you know, an ant, and I'm like, oh my, I got an ant on my ant. There's no ant. It's, you know, your skin gets a little crawly or whatever. So those are beliefs that we have about visible objects. Now, Plato is sad about that because most people get stuck in this area. We never cross the horizontal, horizontal line. We stay in the world of opinions and we make mistakes because our opinions are sometimes mistaken, our beliefs about these things. So one of the things that um, Plato is wanting us to understand at this po point is that people form beliefs about what they think justice is, and because of their beliefs, they do some very unjust things. Now, he's referring to the death of Socrates. Socrates was arrested by the government um, of Athens, and he was charged on um, corrupting the youth and, um, and blaspheming uh, the gods. Now, they made that charge because he was talking to his mentees, the, the young men in Athens that were following him, and he was telling them, go home and challenge your dad, you know, talk to your father, and, um, and ask him why he does things. That annoyed everyone, and and Socrates was challenging people directly, and so that annoyed people because he would go up to you and say, "Why are you doing that? You know, do you think that's right?" and so forth, and so they were very, very annoyed with him, 
Um, they didn't like him causing the, the, the sons to uh, confront the fathers. And then the claim of blasphemy or um, being impious or impious is that he claimed that he knew more than the gods. And that was <coughs> a pretty shocking claim. He said, I know more than the gods because I know I don't know everything. The gods were all running around saying, oh, yeah, I know everything. I know everything, right? They didn't know that they didn't know. In other words, they thought they knew everything, but there were things they, they did not know. The gods in ancient Greece um, were limited in their power, limited in their knowledge. I mean, certainly they had a vast amount more than um, humans, but they weren't all-knowing and all-powerful. So they they tried to claim that they were and Socrates basically said at least I know that I don't know things. So the government in Athens took that to mean that that Socrates was claiming he knew more than the gods and so they brought him up on charges. When they asked him how he pleaded, he said, oh, guilty, yeah, I did that. I've been trying to help you out. He believed, and I think he actually was, performing a service to the city. He was helping the, the city think deeper. He was going to the people. He was ha having them examine what they were doing and why. He has a, a famous quote sa that says, the unexamined life is not worth living. In other words, if you just, uh, you know, get up every day, go about your, you know, your job or your school or whatever, go home, um, you know, watch TV or his version of watching TV, go to bed and get up and do it again. And you never look at what you're doing, why you're doing it, who you are, <clears throat> then, then you're just wasting life. So he was trying to get the city to do that and, uh, or the people in the city to do that. And he said, so yeah, I plead guilty. I was providing a service. Well, that, of course, then meant he had to be sentenced. He was guilty. And at that time, the court in Athens ran like this. The court would, would suggest a punishment. Then the defendant would suggest an alternate punishment. And usually they would be kind of at extreme odds. And they would come to a compromise in the middle. And everybody would be served. <clears throat> it would be just. The city wanted um, Socrates to just leave. They wanted him to exile, leave, get out of Athens. They were annoyed with him. So in order to try and hit that as a middle point, they sentenced him to death. Socrates, who who should have said, hey, uh, how about I exile, and they would have accepted that, instead said, because he'd been doing a service, he thought his sh sentence should be uh, free meals for life in the uh, cafeteria. The cafeteria is not what you think of like cafeteria. It was actually a feasting hall that was provided by the city for the politicians and the esteemed athletes. And so it was the best food and, and wine and it was entertainment. And um, Socrates said, I think that just like those who have served the city, I should be entitled to that kind of um, uh, treatment. So he proposed free meals for life in the cafeteria. Well, all that did was piss off the, the court. And so instead of saying, all right, let's meet in the middle, they were pissed off by what they saw as arrogance, and they said, nope, death. So he was uh, sentenced to death, and within 30 days, he was indeed put to death. He was forced to drink poison and, uh, and die. And so he did. Now, the city or the, the government, the court, thought they were doing justice. Okay? They had a belief about what they were doing. They believed they were doing justice. This is why Plato wants to explain that we need to move beyond beliefs because he said the court actually did a terrible injustice, a terrible injustice. So 
we need to move away from our beliefs and actually understand, for example, the form of justice. And if the court actually had understood the form of um, a justice, then they would not have sentenced Socrates to death. He wants all of us, of course, to climb up this ladder of the divided line and get a better understanding. But he also says, uh, and I love this quote, um, he says, until philosophers are kings or kings are philosophers, there will be no justice. What he means is until the philosophers who are able to do the deep thinking to move beyond this horizontal line into the world of, of intelligence and knowledge, uh, and until, um, until those people have the power of kings, or until the kings have the, well, the wisdom to delve into the forms, until that happens, there will be no justice. Now, as a philosopher named king, I, I kind of like that. But uh, his, his, his thinking is that we need to really understand forms of justice and honesty and truth and beauty if we're going to be the leaders. And if you're going to be the leader, you need to know those things. Okay, so we have covered our beliefs, our visible objects, those kind of things. We're now going to cross the horizontal line into the, the uh, world of thinking about scientific objects. We're now moving into knowledge and the intelligible world. So thinking and scientific objects. By thinking, bad choice of words again, I think. What he means is we have started to understand things as symbols for the unchanging forms. We have started to realize that there is a form of the tree and that these things are specific representations of that uh, form of tree. What we're thinking about he calls scientific objects because they are um, simply things that we're testing, right? Um, so maybe, you know, we, we, we look at, okay, here's an example, right? Scissors. These both partake of the form of scissors. But they're both different. They're different in size. They're different in color. They're different in shape of the handles. And um, they're different in their ability to cut. The brown ones don't cut very well. That's why I got the green ones, and they do cut well. But regardless of the many differences, I understand that these are scissors, and they are stand-ins for the form of scissors. So they are essentially scientific objects that represent the form of scissors. Everything at this point we understand as being a representation or a stand-in for the form. You're all in that spot right now. You're all, you just crossed the line. You may not accept it. You may not think that he's right about what he's saying. But you're understanding that there's this thing, these things called the form that he's talking about, and that the things that we experience in the world are stand-ins for the form. They are representations, physical representations of the non-physical form. And we have crossed that line because we're in that thinking process. So this is, um, in some senses, a transitory time because we are transitioning from the world of opinion into the world of knowledge. Um, it's also sometimes a very long process because we might kind of have a surface understanding that all things are representation for the form of that thing. But it takes us a much longer time to really grasp the forms directly, to really understand the unity of all the forms, and to have the, the true absolute intelligence that he wants us to have. Um, and that we should want to have. Um, let's go ahead and move on, though, to the, the intelligence and the form. So we are thinking about these things. We recognize that they're stand-ins. At some point, you, you get a 
into uh, insight, uh, some intuition perhaps, you grasp with your mind that uh, the forms are the real thing. Everything that I'm doing is because of the forms. The forms are behind everything. And you grasp that in a, in a rational sense. I mean, he is a rationalist. What we know through the mind is what counts. So it's not that I start just touching a lot of books and say, oh, yeah, okay, so there's a lot of books and there must be the forms. It's like, no, I understand that it works the other way. There's a form of something. And the, these things that I experience are stand-ins or representations from for the forms. I understand, or I try to understand when I've hit the, the top of the divided line, that the forms have a connection. So, um, you know, this, this wrist rest for my, my keyboard, you know, partakes of who knows what form. I know at the very least that it partakes of the form of blue, right? It's also flexible and kind of spongy. So um, it may partake of several different forms. And that's fine because almost everything does. I mean, my, my phone not only partakes of the phone, uh, the form of the phone, but, you know, the, there's the purple and, you know, whatever the colors are and those kind of things. Um, so the forms have a, a connection. They all exist together. There's no real conflict between them. Um, and things may partake of many different forms. Okay? Uh, kind of like my example with, what was it, a 73 Corolla? You know, it partakes of the form of color of orange and the color of, or the vehicle, or, you know, vehicle types and so on and so forth. We might get to the top of this scale where we understand that. That is what we should get to, or that's what Plato wants us to get to. However, it doesn't mean you have to know each and every form. It's just too vast. It's really understanding the connection between the forms and that the forms are the reality. So you have the very real forms, the not quite as real, uh, visible objects and the two step removed from reality images or the pictures of the objects. So how do I know anything? Well, what I know is that things are what they are because of the form behind them. Okay, great. This makes sense. Yeah, okay, I get what he's saying. But does it give me any more security that this book is real and in my in my hand? <sighs> Not so much. Okay, so we we've got a little problem there that's gonna uh, come up in a second. But I want to go through the allegory of the cave quickly, um, and 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 kind of wrap up this bit on Plato. So the allegory of the cave is supposed to show us the exact same thing as the divided line. It shows us this process of remembering or learning, the process of education, where we move from being twice rea uh, removed from reality up to actually knowing what reality is. The form is reality. Okay. This, I'm still not so sure of. Anyway, here's the story in the allegory of the cave. There are some people at the bottom of a cave. They have been there apparently all of their lives. And they are um, chained up. They're sitting on a bench. And um, they have blinders on. So all they can see is straight ahead. And what's in front of them is a, uh, a wall, the back wall of the cave. And I think that there is a picture here. Let's see. Sorry about this. Yeah, there's a picture on page... 40, and you see um, that they are chained up. They're looking at the wall. They can't turn and see each other. All they can see is the back wall. They can, however, apparently hear each other and um, imagining that since they've been down in that cave their whole life, they can probably smell each other, but not part of the story. So what happens is behind them is a wall. A short wall and behind 
that wall is a pathway and then behind the pathway is a fire. The fire makes light and on that pathway behind the wall there are people who work in the cave and they have puppets and stick figures you know and they're holding these sticks and they're going along behind the short wall and the light of the fire is casting shadows on the back of the cave. And that's all that the people who are chained up can see. Shadows on the back of the wall. And when they see it, they think it's real. So they are seeing images and imagining that that is the reality. They, uh, in fact, play games. Sometimes they will try to guess what's com coming next. Um, they will try and see who can remember what has, you know, what the order has been f for the longest run, you know, those kind of things. And um, so to them, that's reality. Again, they can't even see each other. Now, what happens is that one day the people who are running the cave take one of the men that's chained up down there and they set him free. And first of all, he's a little startled that they, there's this person there in front of him. And they unchain him and they turn him around and it takes him a, a minute or two for his eyes to adjust to the, the light of the fire. But once it does, he looks around and he sees he's in a cave and he sees the fire and he sees those little stick puppets and uh, the people that are walking with him. And he sees the shadows on the wall and he makes that connection. He moves from imagining into beliefs because now he believes that those stick puppets are the reality. He understands the shadows are just representations of the stick puppet. So the stick puppet is his new reality. Now the people who are running the cave want him to exit the cave and they are taking him up, uh, you know, up the cave floor, uh, up a ramp to the exit or to the in or entrance of the, the cave and he doesn't want to go. Um, he's kicking and screaming and putting up a fight. He does not want to go. This is him holding on to his belief. And it's another commentary by Plato that people want to hold on to their beliefs, that people will fight to the death to hold on to their beliefs. beliefs. And um, so he is he's doing that. He's fighting. But as they are dragging him up the ramp, ramp to the entrance, he can see the opening of the cave and he sees the sunlight and he sees you know, objects that are outside that are you know, lit up by the sun and he starts to realize <coughs> that that stick figure of a tree is a representation for this tree that's actually out there. So he's moved into the world of scientific objects and he's thinking about it now. And he's like, huh, something, something's going on here because I thought the shadows were real. Then I thought the puppets were real. And now I see this scientific, or the, I see this tree. And is it real? And so as he, um, or they take him to the outside of the cave and he sees the sunlight, I mean, his eyes have to adjust. And he, he recognizes that, oh, this is the reality. And of course, this is the metaphor for the forms. So he sees that they are, uh, illuminated by the sun and that's why he can see them. The sun then becomes a metaphor for the form of good. The sun is the ultimate goodness and the form of the good makes everything else visible in this metaphor or this allegory of the cave. So he sees, I know, uh, you know, the trees and he's like, I've got reality now. These are the real trees. And he wants to go back in the cave to tell people, the ones who are still down there, and he does. So he, he goes back down to the bottom of the cave and his eyes have to adjust. And um, he goes before the people who are also startled to see them, see him, so, startled to see something besides shadows. And he tells them, look, you've got to, you know, re there's reality out there. This is just shadows. There's a fire back there. And they don't want to hear it. They do not want any of that. They're like, mm-mm. In fact, they are so upset about him trying to change their beliefs. They want to kill him. They're very angry. They want to kill him. This is more commentary from Plato about the injustice done to Socrates by 
the city of Athens or the government of Athens who wanted to kill him and in fact did kill him. So he tries to convince the people um, the people's minds are not changed and he winds up leaving but it shows that or what Plato is showing here is that very few of us reach beyond our, our comfortable beliefs. We don't want to be taken out of our comfort zone. We don't want our beliefs challenged. We want to hold tight to um, what we know, know or think we know, and we, we don't want to give it up. So that's his epistemology. Um, knowledge is simply recalling the forms and understanding that the forms are behind everything. As far um, as this being a solution to the epistemological problem, well, might be some issues here because in the epistemological problem we are asking the question, what do I know? How do I know it? How can I be certain? Are there limits to my knowledge? Well, what we get here is Okay, how do I know what I know? Well, what I know, our knowledge, is not mistaking these specific particular things as real, but recognizing that they have um, content of the form in them, right? Uh, and you're like, okay, Plato, that, that sounds fine. But how do I know this book is real? How do I know I'm really holding this book? I'm, I have to fall back on my sensory perceptions to say I'm experiencing this and I know it, uh, it is, exists because it partakes of the form, but I still don't have any certainty. And that is the problem. So Plato's theory was interesting. It is, as I said, the first complete theory of knowledge. Um, at least the first one that we've discovered as in being written down and being pretty comprehensive. Does it give us a lot of security and certainty? Not so much. So this project will go on to other philosophers. There were a number of people, of course, that were uh, Plato fans who said, oh yeah, this makes perfect sense. This is, this is, you know, we love Plato. This is great. But uh, overall, as an epistemological theory, it didn't hold up. It, it didn't last. The main reason that we are looking at it is because it, it is kind of interesting and it's also the very first. So with that being said, that's Plato's epistemology and uh, next up will be Descartes.